actually the wrathful avatar of Manjushri, who is the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Uh, Bodhisattva of wisdom is a very wise person, and uh, Avatar and um, Yamataka, this avatar, is wrathful because he goes around destroying ignorance. Okay, um, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Trashkoti and Saptabangi. Um, but I was looking for an illustration and I googled um, Indian logic and power consistency and this came up. I have absolutely no idea why, but I like the picture, so I thought uh, you get it. Okay. All right. So let me explain the background to what I want to talk about. Uh, let's start in the West. Let's start with Aristotle. So in his metaphysics, he defends two principles um, which will be very familiar to you. Um, they're these, the principle excluded middle and the principle of non-contradiction. The principle excluded middle is a statement to the effect that every statement is either true or false. The principle of non-contradiction is to the effect that no statement is both true and false. So you've got two possibilities. Okay, a statement is true and true only, or false and false only, that's it. Now, these principles were enunciated and defended in Aristotle's metaphysics, not his analytics. So the analytics is where you find Aristotle's logic. Aristotle took these to be principles of uh, metaphysics, not logic, although sometimes the division between these two areas is kind of thin. Um, and uh, Aristotle's defense launched these principles into orthodoxy in Western philosophy. I think it's fair to say that uh, pretty much most philosophers in the history of Western philosophy have assumed these two principles. It's not, this is not universal. There have been some exceptions. Oddly enough, the first exception concerning the principle of excluded middle is Aristotle himself, because in the somewhat odd chapter nine of De Interpretatione, Aristotle seems to defend the, the thought that statements, contingent statements about the future are neither true nor false. Scholars argue what to make of this and we're not gonna go into it. Um, and apparent exceptions, the principle of non-contradiction are, are few, but I think probably Hegel fits into that category. Interpreting Hegel is a kind of contentious matter, but I, I think he thinks that some contradictions are true. But anyway, people like this are lone voices. Um, and the fact that they're lone shows just how orthodox these principles have been in the history of Western philosophy. Now, in the last 30, 40 years, I guess, we have seen logicians constructing systems of logic in which uh, these principles fail. Um, so these principles hold in classical logic, um, which is the logic, which is the name for the logic invented by Frege and Russell around the turn of the last uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, but we've seen the construction of a number of systems of non-classical logic, and some of those problematized or don't accept excluded middle some don't accept non-contradiction. So we now know what logical systems look like which reject these principles. Okay, so that's a bit of brief background on the West. Now, let us move to the East and specifically India because the situation there is quite different. Um, there have certainly been logicians in India in its history who defended these two principles. So, for example, there's a school of Hindu logicians called Nyaya, and they defended these principles. Um, also, there are a number of great Buddhist logicians in about the 5th or 6th century, uh, Dignaga and Dharmakirti, who defended these principles. However, the principles have not been established and orthodox in Indian philosophy in the way they have been in the West. In particular, um, there is a strong tradition, um, much older than either Nyaya or the Buddhist logician I mentioned, uh, of systems of thought on metaphysics or logic, I'm not quite sure what you can call them, which reject these principles quite clearly. And uh, what I'm going to do 
is explain two of those. Uh, one's called the Chatras Kati, one's called the Septa Bangi. I'll explain what those mean in a minute. Um, and you'll see how they reject these principles. Now, of course, the people who operated with the Chatras Kati and the Septa Bangi didn't have the techniques of modern mathematical logic at their disposal. Um, but it's clear that you can apply the techniques of mathematical logic, and in particular, the construction of the systems of non-classical logic, to make sense, clear sense, of what's going on in the thinking of these philosophers. Um, this is obviously anachronistic in one sense, I don't think it's pernicious anachronism, but we can talk about that in the discussion if you want. Um, what we're going to be meeting in what follows is uh, a meeting of minds. Uh, some thoughts from Indian philosophy and some thoughts from contemporary non-classical logic. And you'll see how these things fit together. And I take it that these, this meeting of minds benefits both parties. It benefits the Indian thinking because if you, you might well think that people who think that some things be neither true or false or both true and false are just confused, stupid, irrational, okay? This is not the case. You can make perfectly good sense of this in terms of modern mathematical logic. So it defends this classical Indian thinking against this rather, uh, unfortunate charge that these people didn't know what they were doing. On the other hand, um, with the thinking behind the Trashkoti and the Septabangi, um, you've got systems of thought which actually motivate the systems of non-classical logic. Um, I might say that the people who invented the relevant systems of non-classical logic knew absolutely nothing about ancient Indian logic or philosophy. They were, they were motivated by other things. But the systems of thought that you get uh, behind the trash cutting and Sapta Bangi um, show that there is what one can think of profound metaphysical systems which lie behind these formal logics. And whatever else you make of them, they're not simply empty formalisms. So uh, the Indian stuff gives a kind of metaphysical ground or possible ground to some other form of logic. Okay, so that's all the background to where we're going. So um, this is uh, a rough, no, an exact guide. There's an introduction, which you just have. First of all, I'm going to explain the Chachikoti and its role in Buddhism. And then we'll look at the system of non-classical logic, which makes sense of this. And you'll see how exactly. Then we're going to turn to the Saptabangi, which is not Buddhist, it's Jain. Um, and I'll explain the Saptabangi and the role it plays in some Jain thinking. And then we're going to look at another system of contemporary uh, non-classical logic, which uh, you probably haven't met before, even if you've met some non-classical logic, which is plurivalent logic. And uh, you'll see how this makes sense of the Jain Saptabangi. Okay, and then I'll just say a few words to wind up. So, um, that's the end of this introduction. Um, are there any questions? No if, one's put anything in the chat. Okay. Well, so there's nothing much to argue about so far, right? Okay. So let us uh, move on. So first of all, we're going to talk about um, uh, Buddhism and the Chattish Koti. Uh, now, the Buddha lived about five or six hundred years uh, BCE. The dates are uncertain. There's no written uh, records from this time. But um, the sort of thinking that predates the Buddhist thinking on the Chachikoti goes back earlier. So, uh, as a spoiler, here's uh, let me tell you what the Chachikoti is. The Chachikoti is a principle which says that. Um, okay, well, first of all, Chaturish Koti, in Sanskrit, it means four points, four corners. Um, 
what are the four points in the four corners? Well, if I ask you a question, you give me an answer. There, there are four possibilities that the answer is true, false, both or neither. That's the Chattishkati. Okay, so in Aristotelian thinking, you've got only two possibilities. True only, false only, that's it, go home. Whereas in the Chattishkati, you've got four possibilities. True only, false only, both and neither. And the sort of thinking that feeds into the Buddhist Chattishkati is older than the Buddha. So let me give you a couple of examples. So one of the oldest Indian texts is Hindu Rig Veda. Uh, these are religious texts, but you know, it tells you something about the way that people are thinking. And in the Rig Veda, which is probably 1200, maybe 1500 BCE, it says this. Um, and it's talking about the state before creation. There was neither non-existence nor existence then. There was neither the realm of space nor sky, which is beyond it. What stirred where, in whose protection was there water, bottomless deep? Okay, look at the first sentence. There was neither non-existence nor existence. That seems to be clearly a statement of the fact that something is neither true nor false. Okay. Uh, in fact, the thought that something is neither true nor false um, seems to be built into one of the most fundamental principles of Hindu philosophy, which is sometimes called neti neti, not not. So this is a statement of it from the, one of the Upanishads, was it a lot later, maybe 5th century BCE. Um, neti neti means not not. The self, whatever that is, is simply described as not not. It's ungraspable, for it's not grasped. It's indestructible, for it's not destroyed. It has no attachment, it's unfastened, it's not attached, and yet it's not unsteady. For it, immortal passes beyond both these two states in which one thinks, for this, okay, you can read the rest. Look, the point is that um, what it seems to be saying is that the self is indescribable. It's not this, it's not, you, you can't say anything which is true, you can't say anything which is false. So any statements are neither true nor false. So it appears to be at least an inchoate statement that some things are neither true nor false. Despite that notice, it says things about the self. So it doesn't, you don't have to be Bertrand Russell to see that something strange is going on here because it's describing something that's undescribable. And that sounds like a contradiction, I think it is. So implicitly, there's a claim that is both true and false here as well. Okay, one more example before we come to the Chattrishkati itself. Um, there was a, a school of Hindu logicians around the 5th century um, called the Ajavikas. Um, we don't really have any of their texts now, they're lost to history. But um, the, we still have some of the commentaries. So this is one of the commentaries on the Ajavika sect, where it says the following. These Ajavikas are called Triarashikas. Why? The reason is that they entertain everything to be of triple nature. Soul, non-soul, soul and non-soul. World, non-world, world and not world. Being, not being, being and not being, and so on. Okay, you can read the rest for yourself. So obviously, these guys seem to endorse the thought that some things could be both true and false, being and not being, world and not world, and so on. So these are just a few texts in Indian philosophy before the Buddhist texts. And it shows that the Buddhists were not drawing their thinking about the Chattrishkoti uh, from thin air. There was a tradition of this stuff. However, the Buddhists certainly take these four possibilities on board. So, uh, let's come to the Chattrishkoti itself. Uh, as I said, the Chattrishkoti is this principle to the effect that a statement can be true only, false only, both or neither. Um, and uh, here is one of the dialogues, one of the sutras between the Buddha and an interlocutor, where this is absolutely plain. So, uh, Gautama was the name of the Buddha, Buddha is not a name, it's an honorific, like Christ. Um, his name was Gautama, uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, and so uh, the interlocutor is addressing the Buddha. Vacha, 
is his interlocutor. And um, one other thing you need to know is about this word tatagata. A tatagata is someone who's achieved enlightenment. Okay. This is not a talk on Buddhism. We don't need to go into that. But the aim of Buddhism is to achieve enlightenment. When you achieve enlightenment, you do not die. The Buddha achieved enlightenment and then taught for 30 or 40 years. All these, that's the view. So becoming enlightened is not like going to heaven. You can be enlightened in this life. But then the question arises, well, someone achieves enlightenment in this life. What happens when they die? Okay, it's a good question. So this is the text. How is it, Master Gautama? Does Master Gautama hold the view after death a Tathagata exists? Only if this is true and anything else is wrong. Vacha, I do not hold the view after death that Tathagata exists. Only if this is true and anything else is wrong. How then does Master Gautama hold the view after death that Tathagata doesn't exist? Only if this is true and anything else is wrong. Vacha, I don't hold a view after death that Tathagata doesn't exist, only if this is true and anything else is wrong. So if you'd been in Aristotle's Lyceum, the dialogue would have ended there because all the bases are covered, right? But the dialogue goes on. How is it, Master Gautama? Does Master Gautama hold a view after a death that Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist? Only if this is true and anything else is wrong. Vacha, I don't hold the view after death that Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist. Only if this is true and anything else is wrong. Okay, that's the third possibility. Both. Fourth, how then does, does Master Gautama hold a view after death that Tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist, only if this is true and anything else is wrong? Vacha, I don't hold a view, etc., etc. Now, notice that the Buddha doesn't say to Vacha, Look, don't be silly, Vacha. How can, pos how can it be the case that something's both true or false or neither true or not false? Neither does he say, uh, um, look, uh, you you're, missing a you're missing a possibility, Vacha. You know, you're, miss you're forgetting something. So both the Buddha and Vacha seem to take it as understood that... Um, the Chaturashkoti is something like a law of excluded fifth. So instead of something's being true or false and those are exclusive and uh, exhaustive, the four corners of the Chaturashkoti, true only, false only, both and neither, are, are exclusive and exclusive. Now, you'll notice that the Buddha refuses to endorse any of these things. Okay, why is an interesting question. And most of the sutras don't go into this much, but some of them go on to say, what the hell do you mean, Buddha? Uh, and he says, look, I'm telling you how to make your life better and you want to do metaphysics? Forget it. Okay, I'll tell you the important things. Leave all this metaphysical stuff aside. Okay, so that's at least one reason why the Buddha refuses to answer the question. There's a lot more to this story which gets taken up in later Buddhist philosophy, but that's not the subject of this talk. Okay, so now you've seen what the Chaturashkoti is in Buddhist thinking. Um, so how is one going to make sense of this in terms of modern non-classical logic? Well, there's a system called first degree entailment. Um, it's actually the core system of a bunch of systems of logic called relevant logic, but we won't be going into that. Um, and uh, there are many ways of setting up the system of first degree entailment. But one of them is as a four valued logic. So it's a many valued logic with four truth values. And the four truth values are exactly, guess what? True only, false only, both and neither. So uh, let me explain some of the details and I'll try and keep this simple for people who hate logic, uh, of which I know there are many and maybe some of you guys. Uh, so uh, if you hate logic, just go to sleep for five minutes. Okay, you can take my word for this. So first degree entailment has four truth values. It's a four valued logic and they are true, false, both and neither. 
And these are sometimes represented in a diagram called the diamond lattice. And lo and behold, the Chattrashkoti appears before your eyes. Okay. So in, if you're defining a logic, um, the first thing you need to know are what are the values of sentences? Because you're going to assign those values to the propositional parameters, the simplest sentences. You then want to know how you assign the values to the more complex sentences. This is what true tables do. Okay. So how's that going to work in this context? Well, just think about classical logic for a moment. Think about truth tables for a moment. A sentence A and B is true, just if A is true and B is true. Okay. Um, and a sentence A or B is false, if either A is false or B is false. Okay, so that's um, standard. How do you apply that thought in the present case? Because now we've got true only and both true and false, and both of those are kinds of truth, right? And we've got false only and both true and false, and that's a kind of falsity. So we've got to take those possibilities into account. So let's look at an example. Suppose A is T up here and B is little b. Okay, what's that saying? Well, it's saying that A is true only and B is true and false. So they're both true. Okay, so A is true and B is true. So the conjunction is true. But um, since B has the value little b, it's false. So A and B is false. So A and B is false as well. So it's true and false. So it has the value B. Okay. So really you're just applying classical truth conditions in the context where you've got two ways in which something can be true and two ways in which something can be false. Um, Similarly, if A is B and B is N, so we're over these two corners now, okay, what's the conjunction? Well, um, is both of these guys true? No, this one isn't, so it can't be true. Uh, is one or other of these guys false? Yeah, this one, it's both true and false. So um, the conjunction is just plain false, so it's down here. Uh, okay, so you can look at it this way, but you can figure out all the cases, but a, neat, a nice easy way to remember what's going on here is the value of a conjunction is what mathematicians call the greatest lower bound of the values of A and B. So what that means in a nutshell is when you can join two things, you just go down the arrows, all right, to find the first thing which is less than or equal to both. So when you can join T and B, we go down arrows to find the greatest thing which is less than or equal to both of them, and that's B. When you can join B and N, you just go down arrows to find the first, the, the greatest thing that's less than both of them, less than or equal to both of them, and that's F. So conjoining is going down arrows, right, and disjunction. It's just going up arrows in the same way. That's conjunction and disjunction. What about negation? Well, let's come back to standard classical logic. Not A is true if A is false, and not A is false if A is true. That's familiar enough. So if A is true only, its negation must be false only, and vice versa. And if A is both true and false, well, its negation is false and true. That's the same. And if A is neither true nor false, not A is neither false nor true. That's the same. So um, logicians say that B and N are fixed points for negation. Negate a B, you get a B. Negate an N, you get an N. All right. If you're defining a system of logic, you need to do three things. You need to say what the values are. You need to say how they're extended to uh, complex sentences. And then finally, you need to say what validity is when an inference is valid.
Now, in a many-valued logic, some of the values are called designated. And these are the ones that valid inferences preserve. So a valid inference is one such that whenever the premises are designated, so is the conclusion. So in this case, what are the designated values? Well, T and B, because those are both truth, okay? Truth only and both true and false. So an inference is valid just if whenever the premises are true, that is T or B, so is the conclusion. And of course, that's exactly the same as in classical logic. Classical logic, the valid inferences are the ones that are truth preserving. So um, there's really nothing very exciting going on here. Um, this is exactly classical logic. The only thing that's changed is that we've made it possible for truth and false. In, in classical logic, truth and falsity are exclusive and exhaustive. And now we've just changed that assumption. They can overlap or they can underlap. Everything else is exactly the same. So this is really just classical logic with this kind of metaphysical assumption about ex the exclusivity and exhaustivity of truth and falsity waived. Okay, now let's talk about two principles of inference which are important. They're on the screen. The first one is now commonly called explosion. And it says that for, if you've got any contradiction, it entails anything. So if you've got inconsistent information, the information explodes and delivers you everything. There's a kind of dual principle, which doesn't have a standard name, but this, this is obviously it. Okay, that's obviously the dual of this. Uh, it doesn't have a standard name, but duality suggests calling it implosion. So that's what I'll do. So explosion is that a contradiction implies everything. Implosion is that everything implies excluding middle. And obviously um, those are ways of expressing excluding middle and non-contradiction. Uh, this one's pretty obvious, okay? That's obviously a way of expressing excluded middle, it ain't quite so obvious that that's a way of expressing non-contradiction. But if you think about it, it really is, because what it's saying is if you've got a contradiction, then wow, you know, the moon is made of green cheese, one squared is 17, Donald Trump is wise, you know, all these absurd conclusions, okay? You don't want that. So you don't want contradictions, okay? So explosion is really a way of expressing non-contradiction. And uh, explosion is not valid in first degree entanglement. Just give A the value B, then you can figure this out for yourself. The premise has also the value B, which is designated. Make big B the value F. It doesn't preserve designation. And implosion is not valid. Give A the value T, which is designated. Give B the value N, which isn't. And you can just figure out that the value of B or not B is N. So this inference does not preserve it. And this is kind of what you'd expect, right? If something's gonna be both true and false, you do not expect explosion. If something's gonna be neither true nor false, you don't expect implosion. Now, one final comment on this. As I said, this explosion is really a statement of, of non-contradiction. Yeah, I might have thought that the best way to express non-contradiction is this, right? That this thing is not the case that B and not B follows from anything you like. That will be a bit like implosion, right? But this does not express non-contradiction in this context. Why? Because if B has a value B, then um, B and not B, so it's not the case. If B, capital B, has the value B, then this formula itself has the value B. Now, um, I've gone off the bottom of my screen here. So, uh, ah, it's gone. All right. So, uh, if, oh God, it's come back. 
you know, one lives with these little uh, annoyances when doing things uh, remotely. Please be patient. So if B has a value B, then so does this apparent instance of the law of non-contradiction, this thing. Okay. Indeed, if big B has a value B, so does this more complicated contradiction on the bottom line. Wow. So it's a, you might call this a secondary contradiction, but yeah, just think about it for a moment. If you can accept a contradiction, then um, it's not the case that B and not B ain't gonna rule it out because you might have that and B and not B. So this is why you really need explosion as a statement of non-contradiction. That might be a bit surprising. All right, uh, so that's virtually everything on first degree entailment. Uh, last slide, a rule system for first degree entailment looks like this. Uh, if you've never seen this kind of junk before, ignore it, doesn't matter. If you have seen systems of natural deduction before, then this is what it looks like. The rules for conjunction and disjunction are absolutely normal. And instead of the rules for negation, you've got these rules of double negation and two versions of De Morgan. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, so that's everything on the Chatteris Crossy and First Degree Entailment. Um, this, I think, is a good place to pause to see if anyone wants to ask any questions. Um, I, I have a question, but I think it might be best to leave it till the end. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? I mean, I'm not sure how much you guys know about logic, so uh, I may have moved too fast for you over first degree entailment. If I have, and you haven't followed me, uh, and I can say things to clarify, this is a good place to jump in. Okay, no one's jumping, so let's move on. Oh, someone just um, posted in the chat, they didn't quite follow the final bit with the bullet points. Okay, um, so let's go back. Oh, I, maybe they mean the, um, the missing part of the derivation for um, disjunction elimination. Is that what they mean? I think they mean the previous slide. This one? All right, okay. Maybe. Uh, well, um, whoever it was, do you want to unmute mute yourself and uh, make your thoughts clearer? Um, I mean, I didn't quite follow the um, what the last the, the, when you were talking about the last three bullet points. Um, okay. I I mean I don't have a lot of background in logic, so it might be obvious, but yeah. All right. Well, look. The point is this, this is really a statement of the principle of non-contradiction. It's, it's telling you you can't have a contradiction. Um, this is a statement of excluding middle, if A then B or not B, and you might have thought that what will be a statement of non-contradiction is this guy, right? Because if you negate that, you get this. But Oddly enough, that is not a statement of non-contradiction because you can have contradictions even though that holds. In particular, if you give B the value little b, the value both true and false, obviously you've got some contradictions. Um, but oddly enough, this statement is not the case that B and B itself has the value B, so it's true. Indeed, I'm just waiting for the thing to disappear. Disappear. Okay. Indeed, this more complex contradiction on the bottom line holds. So, this principle um, does not hold in first degree entailment. Uh, and it's not really an expression of non contradiction because you can have something which is both true and false. And it doesn't rule out this kind of situation, either the vanilla flavored con uh, 
uh, vanilla flavored negation of a contradiction or this more complex contradiction which is now hidden by it there it goes which is now uh, a visible okay so uh, if things can have the value b then you you can have this it's not the case that b and not b so not the case that b and not b doesn't rule out contradictions i mean it's odd until you've seen it but such is life is that does that help at all i think so what so like one final thing so, but explosion does work in this instance? No. So in first degree entailment, both explosion and implosion are invalid. Oh, invalid, oh, okay. Okay, and explosion is invalid because things can have the value little b. Um, in other words, it's possible for a and not a to take the value little b, uh, which is uh, a version of truth. And implosion is not valid because it's possible for big B to take the value N, neither true nor false, in which case B or not B takes the value N, it ain't true, okay? So in a minute, we're gonna meet systems of logic where one or other of these guys holds. But for the moment, in a first degree entailment, neither of these guys holds, just precisely because you've got these values, little B and little N to play with. And these are the two really distinctive things of the Chaturjkoti. You know, an Aristotelian is familiar with the top guy and the bottom guy, T and F. What they're not familiar with is the guys on the sides of the diamonds, uh, B and N. Okay? Thanks. Good. Uh, look, clarificatory questions are important because logic is one of those subjects where um, if you don't follow, you can get completely lost, and sometimes a few words of clarification can help a lot. Okay, let's go on. So we've now dealt with uh, the Chaturjkoti, so let's move to the Saptabhangi. So, the Saptabhangi is a feature of Jain thinking. So the uh, Jain Sorry to cut you off. Um, yeah. We have another question in the chat. Okay. Um, why is it that the conjunction of B, both true and false, and N, neither true nor false, uh, purely false? Um, okay. if, the one, if one of the conjuncts is neither true nor false, how can we know that the entire conjunction is false? Right, okay, so let's have a look. These are the classical truth conditions. The conjunction is true if both conjuncts are true, and it's false if one or other is false. Okay? So let's do, let's suppose that A is B, that's over this side, and B is N, that's over this side, and let's apply these classical truth conditions. First of all, ask whether the conjunction is true. Then we're gonna consider whether it's false. Well, for it to be true, both conjuncts have to be true. Is that the case? No, because this guy isn't, right? This one is, but this one isn't. This one's both true and false, but so it's true. But this one isn't. All right. Now, what about falsity? Or what does it take for a conjunction to be false? Well, one of the conjuncts has to be false. Now, is one of these conjuncts false? Yeah, this guy is. It's true and false, so it's false. So the conjunction ain't true, but it is false. So you've got to go down the arrows to F. Okay, is that any clearer? Uh, they say it is. Okay, all right, good. I'm glad you're asking questions. Um, any others before we go on? Okay, Matt, I notice now that it's 10 to three um, and um, we're probably about two thirds of the way through the talk, but it ain't gonna finish at uh, three, uh, what's that, uh, eight o'clock your time. Um, mm. Although we could curtail it and go straight into a discussion. Uh, I mean, um, uh, so we, we started a little late. I, I'm happy to keep going if, if you'd like to. Um. 
I'm happy to go on, but I don't want to trespass on people's attention. So this is a good place to stop. If I carry on, we're not going to get to another place to stop for 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes. Okay. All right. Let's, so let's talk about the Saptabhagi. So Jainism is um, another school of Indian philosophy and religion. It was founded by, God, sorry, my neighbor is mowing the lawn. I hope that is not too distracting. Um, Jainism was founded by a thinker called Mahavira, who is a rough contemporary of the Buddha. And uh, both Jainism and Buddhism rejected central tenets of Hinduism, so they're sometimes called unorthodox schools. So Buddhism is an unorthodox school, and so is Jainism. Is that noise distracting? Um, it's not. It's not particularly loud for me. Um, I, I, I'm managing fine. I don't know how everybody else is doing. I think it's fine for me too. Not too. Bad. Yeah, it's very faded. Okay. That's the trouble from working from home. You have neighbours. Look, um, if it does become a problem, please let me know, okay? Um, I'm not quite sure what I can do about it, but I'll certainly try. So, um, Jainism and Buddhism are two unorthodox schools of, in, uh, of Indian thought. Uh, and so let's talk a bit about Jainism. So Jainism is very distinctive because it has this view called Anakantavada, which means non-one-sidedness. What does that mean? Well, it means this. The Hindus thought that people have a soul, a self. The Buddhists thought they didn't. Who's right? Well, the Jains said, well, they're both right in a way, you know, um, because reality itself is many faceted. And in one facet, it's true that people have a self, and in one facet, it's not. So you've got to think of reality as something like a cut diamond. It's got many facets. Things hold in facets only and something could be true in one facet and false in another. So, um, it's a kind of ironic philosophy in the sense that you can have both these things because reality itself is multifaceted. Um, to grasp reality as such, you've got to grasp all the facets at once. Uh, can you do that? Well, it's difficult. It's a bit like seeing all, uh, all six sides of a cube at the same time. Um, maybe you can do that if you're omniscient, uh, so you've achieved Jain enlightenment, but for mere mortals like you and me, not really. But anyway, claims are true or false with respect to a facet, um, and something can be true with respect to one facet and false with respect to another. So this Anakantavada, the doctrine of non-one-sidedness. Okay, then there's this word syat. Now, um, if I just say uh, people have a self, that's sort of true in a way, but if I leave it at that, it's a bit misleading. Because it's true, but it's true from one facet, from one perspective. So instead of saying people have a self, it's better to say syat people have a self. Okay, so what is the word syat doing? Well, it's a standard word in Sanskrit. It means something like arguably, perhaps, maybe, but the Jains use it with a technical sense. 
and you can think of it as meaning from a certain perspective. So siat, people have a self, means from one perspective, from one facet of reality, people have a self. Okay, so that's what siat means. Okay, so you need to know those two things. And um, another thing you need to know is I've talked about truth and falsity, but in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that because the Jains think there are three basic truth values. T and F, well, those are our friends. And this third value, which I'm just going to call I for the moment. What is the value I? Is it both true and false? Is it neither true nor false? Well, um, the answer to that question is not clear and scholars of Jainism de debate this matter. Okay, some scholars think it means both, some think that it means neither. And I'm not gonna go into that dispute here. We're gonna look at both possibilities. All right. Finally, the Sapta Bangi. Sapta Bangi means seven predicates, seven categories. Um, and the Sapta Bangi tells you that there are, if you consider a statement, there are seven possibilities. Okay, we've only got three so far. Where the hell does the seven come from? Well, the answer is that seven is two to the three minus one. Now everything I'm sure is obvious. No, okay. Um, you've got three possibilities. Each of them can hold or fail. That's two to the three, that's eight. Minus one, one of those can't. Okay. Um, which one's missing? I'll tell you in a second. But let's have a look at um, a statement of the Sapta Bangi. Um, so this is a statement of the Sapta Bangi. The seven predicate theory consists in the use of seven claims about sentences each preceded by arguably or conditionally. That's this word siat. All concerning a single object and its particular properties composed of assertions, denials, either simultaneously or successively without contradiction, and there as follows. Okay, so there are seven possibilities. What are they? Okay, siat, an object exists. The first predicate arguably uh, pertains to assertion. Two, siat, it doesn't exist. The second predicate attains, pertains to denial. So that's T and F, right? Um, skip the third for the moment. Skip down to the fourth. Arguably, it's non-assertable. The fourth predicate pertains to simultaneous assertion and denial. That's the value I, all right? And it's non-assertable. That looks like neither true nor false. Simultaneous assertion and denial looks like both true and false. So there's a kind of ambiguity here, but never mind that. It's the third of these possibilities. All right, so those are the three basic possibilities. Now we're going to have the others. So have a look at three. Arguably, siat it exists, siat it doesn't exist. So the third predicate pertains to success of a certain number. So this is a combination of the first two. Five, arguably it exists, arguably it's non-assertable. The fifth predicate pertains to an assertion and a simultaneous assertion. Not. So it's the first possibility and the fourth. And um, what you get in the, the others is that you get every possible non-empty combination of those three values, right? So a statement can have one of those values, two of those values, or three of those values. This last one is the three of those values. So what possibility is missing? Which one? Well, that none of them holds. So statements can fall into one, can have one value, two value, or three values. They can't have no values. Why not? Because at least, because reality has at least one facet. So at least one of these has got to hold. 
right? So to say it's true means that it's true in some facet. To say it's false means it's false in some facet. To say it's true and false means it's true in some facet, false in some facet, and not I in any of them. So those are how you get the two to the three minus one possibilities. It's all the combinations of the three basic ones minus the one that you can't have, and you can't have that because at least one of them's got to hold because there's got to be at least one facet. So that's the Scepter Bangi. When you meet the number seven for the first time, you think, oh my God, seven? How the hell do you get that? Well, you get that because it's three basic possibilities combined in every possible way minus the one you can't have. Okay. That's the Scepter Bangi. Okay, how the hell do you make sense of that with non-classical logic? So let's go on to this. I'm going to describe something called plurivalent logic to you, which is exactly a kind of non-classical logic where statements can have more than one value. Now, do not confuse this with many-valued logic. In a many-valued logic, every statement has exactly one value. In plurivalent logic, a statement can have more than one value. Okay, these are not the same thing. So what are the values in question? Well, you've seen what the basic values are, okay? So let's come back to the Chashashkoti. There are four possible values. Now, for Jane's, there are only three. Okay, there's this third value, I. Um, is I both or neither? Well, as I said, this is contentious. But suppose I means both. Then you're looking at the left-hand side of this diagram, right? You just wiped out the right-hand side. That makes perfectly good sense. And if you do that, you get a logic called LP, which has three truth values, T, B, and F. On the other hand, if you take I to be neither, you have wiped out the left-hand side of the diagram, and you've got a three-value logic called T, what called K3. Don't worry about the names, they're just standard. Um, so the basic Jaina logic the three value logic is either going to be K3 or LP, depending how you interpret I. If you interpret it as both, you get LP. If you interpret it as neither, you get K3. So these are two well known three value logics. Um, and K3 validates explosion but not implosion. Well, you, you expect that because K3, you've got the value N. So you don't get implosion, but you haven't got the value B, so you don't get explosion. LP validates implosion, but not explosion. So that's just playing the other side of the street. Okay. So if you want to characterize those two logics in proof theoretic terms, you just take the axioms, but you take the rules of first degree entailment, and for K3 you add explosion. And for LP, you add implosion. Okay. So that's more or less what you'd expect. Okay. So those are two basic three valued logics. And you can see that you can get them from the Chachikoti just by looking either the left hand side or the right hand side of the diagram. All right. But we want to make it possible that statements can have more than one of those three values. This is where plurivalence comes in. So, in a plurivalent logic, formulas may have more than one value, and in particular, more than one of those three values. So, to define a logic, you need to do three things, as I said. You need to say what the value, or in this case, values are of the simple sentences. I told you that. You need to say how the values are then assigned to more complex sentences. 
And then you need the definition of validity. So you know the first of those, let me tell you about the second. Let's take conjunction as an example. To compute the values of A and B, you combine all the values of A and B. You just do the obvious thing. Okay, so suppose that I has the values T and F, and B has the value I. And it doesn't matter whether I is little b or little n, because you're going to get the same place in the lattice, whatever. Okay? In mathematical terms, the two sides of the Chattrishkoti, the diamond lattice, are isomorphic. The only difference is whether the value is designated or not. So suppose A has the values T and F, and B has the values T and I. We're just going to compute all the possibilities. So A has the values T and F. Here we go. I've written those down here. B has the values T and I. I've written them across the top. And now we compute all the possibilities. T and T is T. T and I is I. Whichever, whether you think of I as B or F, as of B or N. F and T is F. And F and I is F. Okay, so the possible values of the conjunction are T, I and F. Okay. You, get I, you get F twice, but multiplicities don't count. All right, so that just illustrates that to compute the values of a conjunction, you do all the possible things. All right, so in particular, in this case, A and B has the values T, L, A, and F. Um, and you do exactly the same for disjunction, okay? You do the, you compute all the possible values. Um, what about negation? Well, you do, again, the obvious thing. To compute the values of not A, you just negate all the values of A. So suppose that A has the values T and I. So there's the value of A. There's A has the values T and I. If we negate those, we get F when we negate T and I when we negate I. So um, the values of not A are F and I. So you know now how to extend the values and assign the values to compound formulas. The final thing you need to know is just how you define validity. But how do you do that? Well, an inference is valid if whenever the premises have a value that is designated in the underlying three-valued logic, so does the conclusion. So, suppose the value i is neither true nor false. Then the only designated values is t, the top guy. So what this is saying is that an inference is plurivalent valid if whenever the premises all have at least the value t, so does the conclusion. On the other hand, if you take this value i, to be little b, both true and false, the designated values are t and b, so an inference is valid in plurivalent logic, just if whenever the premises all have at least the value b, t, or at least the value b, maybe has both, but has at least one of those, then so does the conclusion. So that's the definition of validity. Okay. The next question you're going to ask if you're a logician is, well, okay, good. Um, so what things are valid and what things aren't? And you can prove the following results, which I'm not going to try to prove for you. You can take my word for it. The consequence relation of plurivalent LP is the same as LP. It's kind of odd. You sort of throw in these extra possibilities, but you haven't actually changed the consequence relation. Exactly the same inferences come out as valid. And since LP does not validate explosion, it does validate implosion. The same is true of the plurivalent version. Okay. All right. What about plurivalent K3? Remember we had a, we had a look at these two three value logics, LP, and K3, whether you're playing the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the diamond lattice. If you plurivalentize, 
the left hand side it doesn't change the consequence relation that's what this is telling you you might expect the same to be true if you plurivalentize the right hand side that does not happen the consequence relation of plurivalent k3 is not k3 it's fda so you might not have expected that but k3 does not validate implosion it does validate explosion fde you know invalidates both and why is that okay how come when you plurivalentize you don't get explosion anymore well it's i'll show you why and it's not hard to get your head around if you follow me so far um in plurivalent a3 k3 you haven't got explosion why okay because a can have the values t and f okay it can have more than one value so if a has the value t and f what values does not a have well if a has a value t and f not a has the values f and t same so both a and not a have the values t and f so what does their conjunction have? Well, hey, they both have the values T and F. So the conjunction is T and F because both conjuncts are T and at least one conjunct is F. So this guy now becomes designated in the extended sense. It has at least one value which is designated, namely T. Um, so let B just have the value F and you can see the inference is invalid. So plurivalence has done something for the consequence relation. Now, the fact that you've got the possibility of multiple values actually serves to invalidate something that was invalid before. And that did not happen when you plurivalentize the other side of the chapter. You might not have expected that, it's true. Now, as I say, I'm gonna, not gonna prove those things to you if anyone really wants to know, you can write to me and I'll send you the papers where it's proved. Um, but uh, that's it. Um, I'm just gonna, rather than let people ask questions now, let me just finish and then we're going to questions, Matthew, okay? Um, so, what have we seen? What we've seen is this. The principles of non-contradiction and excluding middle are pretty orthodox in Western philosophy. Some Indian logicians and philosophers subscribed to them, some did not. So the situation is different in Indian philosophy. And uh, in particular, the Buddhists with the Chachkoti seem to subscribe to neither excluded middle nor non-contradiction. The situation is a bit more complex for the Jains because it's not clear whether the third basic value should be thought of as a both or a neither. But if it's a neither, then again, they reject excluded middle and non-contradiction. If it's both, then you just got LP. So um, it invalidates uh, non-contradiction but it does not validate invalidate explosion okay so it's a bit more complex but nonetheless you've certainly however you cut the cake you've got a rejection of um non-contradiction and maybe a rejection of excluded middle as well all right so that's where we're going that's the end um I hope that the logic hasn't been too heavy. Um, if you want to know more about these things, then you can email me and I'll send you some places where this stuff is written up. But I thought uh, I would end with um, Yamantaka. So thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. That was a really interesting talk.